So 2018, it's just around the corner. Um, uh, if, like me, many of you, I'm sure, have been doing your budgets and whatever else, so you feel that you're already totally immersed into 2018 and what your activities will be. Um, well, what, 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 what does it mean for us um, as we put our plans together? Well, I think, as I said right at the outset, I mean, we've looked at the research we do on a continual basis during 2017, some of those key messages that have come out of that research. We've looked at what's our learning from the activities and the levels of engagement we've had during 2017, and how do we shape that? Um, and then how have the BVRLA and the board of the BVRLA responded to those two dynamics? And at the same time, how have we responded to taking a, a longer term view um, in terms of some of the, the issues we believe that we'll have to represent you on um, into the future, which may not be that apparent in terms of the, the current workload. Um, and I think some key building blocks, which you should be aware of as members, um, we will make a significant, another significant investment um, in our IT infrastructure during 2018. Um, in particular, we will have a new website. Um, and our website now receives in the order of 400, already receives in the order of 450,000 visits every year. Um, our website is increasingly used. The majority of the visits are from actually your customers. Um, and they're coming to us looking for advice as to how they should engage with you um, to understand what their rights might be, how they can engage with the conciliation service what support they can get from the conciliation service. They want to understand what fair wear and tear means. Um, as you'd expect, your customers are rather sophisticated, or your customers' drivers um, are very sophisticated individuals. They want to do their homework, they want to be informed, they want to understand what their rights are. Um, and increasingly, the BVRLA's website is seen as the first port of call for that access to data. Now, our website is great, um, it serves its purpose, it can accommodate, as I said, 450,000 visits a year and more, but it needs now to move on. Um, and um, I think we've got support from our board to invest in a new website, which will give us all of the ability to make this focused communications and support to individual segments of membership. It will give us an e-commerce ability, which we've never had before. So rather than writing out checks or paying by direct debit, you can book, pay, services, training, um, events um, on the website. Um, we're upgrading our, our new CRM um, system um, to, to CRM next phase, full integration with the website. Again, I think will enable us to give much more focused service to our members. Um, and I think very importantly, um, we're making a significant investment in terms of our lobbying capability. Um, so we see that the list of areas where we need to be active on in representing our members' interests at government, both local and national levels, or to our um, um, quangos or government-related bodies, is just growing. That list is becoming more diverse. So we need more lobbying and comm support, both internally to do that, and we will be retaining external lobbying support also to act on your behalf in terms of supporting our efforts um, into government. So a, a major, major investment um, on behalf of the members um, to support this external lobbying um, uh, work that we will do. To the extent that the decision is taken that we will dip into, now we'll not dip into, we will plunge into our resources um, and our reserves for 2018, 19 and 20. So we're taking a long-term strategy in terms of over that period of time significantly upgrading both the expertise we have, but the quantity and the, um, the quantum of support we have um, in terms of that external lobbying activity. And you'll see and hear more of that as we go through 2018. Um, and the areas we'll be really working on again, um, I think the whole, and these all form, for me, all fall under this general umbrella of it's Brexit related, it's the automotive sector, and these are factors which again, need specific UK and or European um, activities on. So air quality and emissions, um, the managing of the diesel 
transition that we're going through in the armour in the UK. A key armour challenge for us and on behalf of members, how clean air zones are implemented, how we implement, oh, how we implement, how we get WLTP data, in what shape, size, form it's going to come, um, how we work with the OEMs to get that data, how we communicate that on the WLTP data, on the CO2 and the emissions on the implications of that, how we communicate that into the wider marketplace, how we support members in doing that to their customers. Um, and then also this whole area, are there other cleverer, smarter ways of achieving some of these um, uh, um, emission standards that both national and local government in the UK want to achieve. Um, we believe there are. Um, we believe some of the discussion around currently diesel scrappage schemes um, are misinformed, um, lack evidence in terms of being able to justify that a diesel scrappage scheme is the right approach. We've involved um, and engaged in extensive research where we think certainly in some of the larger metropolitan areas, actually a scrappage scheme is the wrong way to go. Um, and there's much more opportunity in some of those cities um, to have a mobility credits approach. So if we can get somebody out of um, uh, an old diesel and actually accepting that they're not going to be able to buy, I mean, to say that someone's going to come out of a 10-year-old diesel and they can afford to go into an ultra-low emission, um, brand new ultra-low emission vehicle, I think is misguided. That's not the trend we're seeing today. The trend is very clearly, if they come out of a diesel car today, they're going into a petrol car for the most part. Um, so we believe there's an, a, way to, a way to use mobility credits to encourage people that give up your old diesel car, actually don't replace it with another car because it probably doesn't make sense. Um, and then we can find ways to facilitate your transport through car clubs, car rental, tubes, or whatever else um, across major cities. And that we've had those discussions now. They're starting to resonate when we have those discussions with local, go go local government officials. Um, taxation, of course, taxation will always be um, a key, um, key lobbying platform for us. Um, I think history tends to show that our sector is being regarded as being a bit of a cash cow for government. I think some of the, the, recent, cha the recent issues we've seen with the budget um, and some of the changes that have, ha have happened around ultra-low emission vehicles, the vehicle excise duty changes that happened both in this budget um, and, and last year. Again, we think there are better ways, stronger messages we have um, to get a, um, some improvements in terms of how these processes work for our members, but at the same time, in terms of putting in place smarter approaches to achieve the emissions levels and the emissions targets that government have um, other than what they're currently trying to, to do. And we believe there's a significant body of work to do still on company car fleets. Um, we believe that the company car sector, again, is, is misunderstood or not understood or even deliberately not understood. Um, and we believe that the role that company cars play in terms of getting new technology, if it's emissions or if it's safety technology, um, getting that onto the road and subsequently into the used car market um, has a very, very positive impact um, across the whole um, of UK PLC, but also in terms of addressing the UK, uh, helping the UK in terms of delivering on some of their, some of their um, uh, emissions targets as well. So again, a core platform for us for 2018. Um, as you'd expect, the whole area of the connected car, um, we've been talking about that in these sessions now for at least three years. Um, and in all of the fleet tech congresses that we've been having. Again, we get into more granular discussions now, as you would expect, as the era of, of the connected car really starts to become a reality. So very practical discussions we're having at an EU level about the OBD port. Um, believe it or not, the importance of the OBD port in being able to allow members to deliver their telematic solution to their customers in the way that they choose to, um, uh, choose to want to do it. The discussion around connected cars and data is now really developing into um, uh, another discussion around mobility as a service. And it's difficult to talk to many 
major leasing companies or any major rental companies today that don't have mobility as a service very much front of mind um, in terms of a business opportunity. Um, I think for those not thinking about it as a business opportunity, it's a business risk. Because um, um, I think this is coming. Um, we, we, we've seen more of this discussion at city level now, um, uh, at local authority level. What does it mean? How could it be implemented? What are the obstacles? What are the opportunities? What's the role for a lease co? What's the role for a rental company? Where does car sharing fit into this? Um, and again, it's a, a concept which is, a, I think, starting to really grasp the attention of politicians and officials, not just in the UK, but around Europe. Um, and, it's, and it's coming. And clearly then GDPR. I think GDPR, there is work to be done with the Information Commissioner in terms of how GDPR will be implemented into the UK. For example, how does GDPR implement um, or interface with the connected car? What does the GDPR mean in terms of personal data with, with connected car data and how it's connected by OEMs or how, uh, how OEMs release that data to our members and to our members' customers? So again, it's a big, is big strategic issue as well as a very tactical issue because we all need to be compliant. Now, and this is coming in the middle of next year and I suspect that 99% of members will not be compliant in the middle of next year with the new GDPR. But the important thing is you'll be on the right path to being compliant um, by the middle of next year. And if you're not on that path to being compliant, your business will be exposed. Um, and I won't dwell on the, the penalties and the fees and the potential sanctions which are, uh, are available when you're not GDPR compliant, but they are obviously significant. Um, and then industry reputation. Um, we've already seen this year, and this year isn't the first year, how easy it is for national media to exert a disproportionate negative influence on our sector if they are so minded to do. Um, and we believe we need to get ahead of this game um, and get our, ourselves firmly around the table um, with officials and in the media in terms of the role that our sector or BVRLA members um, are playing generally in terms of supporting the UK economy. Um, so we obviously need to be ahead of the game in terms of the motor finance, the automotive review there. Um, we can anticipate already, even two years before the results are published, some of the findings that will come out of that review. Um, we're already sitting down with a, um, a, a task force of both brokers and a task force of lease codes in terms of how we get ahead of the game um, in terms of this motor finance outcomes. Um, car rental, um, we need to get ahead of the game here. Um, you'll hear a lot more today about some of the challenges that car rental are facing, not least of all in terms of terrorism, um, not least of all the continual press coverage around some of the operational issues from some members um, or from some car rental operators. Um, not necessarily in the UK. Actually, the press coverage we get in the UK is very often based upon findings from Spain, Portugal, Italy, other continental European markets. But if you read the press, or you read the press, you'd find, you'd think this was in the UK. Um, and we need to do more representing that sector in terms of getting the positive messages across um, from rental. And then the whole impact of vehicle terrorism the impact that has on insurance for rental members um, is something that, again, we need to be very active on during 2018. So hopefully that's left you with a, a reasonable summary that we have a, a very aggressive, a very ambitious and a very well-supported programme of activities for 2018. It's based upon, I think, what you've told us through um, various research studies we've done during 2017. It's based upon our learning from engagements on, on your behalf during 2018. Um, and it's well funded and supported through increased resources in our internal lobbying and comms teams, external resources from external lobbying companies, um, and through an investment, a very important investment, both in terms of our um, new website, 
on which will lead to much, I think, more effective and easier member engagement, but also then supporting that, an increased spend, an increased budget, significantly increased budget year over year, of about 50% in terms of our general research activities. So we are developing um, a body of evidence to support our lobbying platforms when we take them forward. So an ambitious um, plan for 2018, but I hope you'll agree one that is well-funded, um, well-developed, well-thought-out, and generally well-reflecting the priorities that you as members are telling us that we should be addressing. Thank you very much. <laughs>